Thank you for attending the um, Neuroimaging Study Day today. Uh, my name is Simon Hughes, and I'm going to give you the first talk on FDG, PET-CT, uh, brains. And this is really, uh, the first part is about acquisition and uh, reconstruction uh, of these FDG brains. So what we're going to talk about, or try and talk about, is um, about how to perform and check FDG, PET-CT brain scanning, how to display these scans correctly, uh, an approach to reporting the scans, and then give you some structured reporting that I use. So uh, a little bit of um, polemic. These are simple images of probably the most complicated thing in the universe. But what we're looking for are patterns of changes which impact on real decision making. And that's really what we'll talk about a lot today. Uh, so this is a quote from the all party parliamentary group in dementia who produced a report 10 years ago on unlocking the diagnosis and this is very important because uh, this was given by oral evidence by me and this is important so it says that what we need to do really is change the cultural view of dementia and 10 years later that struggle remains uh, the, this report from the all-party parliamentary group uh, says that diagnosis was important because it opens doors and gives people access to treatment and support services. It allows them to plan for the future and it provides knowledge of what is happening to them. But it's still sad that it is common for people to die with this fatal brain disease and never be given a formal diagnosis. In the last uh, 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 dementia report, large, large one from the government, which was now 12 years ago, shows that the um, number of people living with dementia was just below 1 million, but that the economic cost of dementia is more than cancer and heart disease put together. Uh, one of the reasons for this is because of this very large unpaid carer costs. And so you can start to argue that dementia is in the Western world one of the most important diseases that we know. And we think that the uh, cost is large that, and that the number of people who are living with dementia is going to increase and it continues to increase. It affects about 6% of people over 65. And if you look at the disability adjusted life years, dementia is a more uh, severe uh, burden on patients and their families than diabetes. One of the things I have fought for many years is what I call the despair diagnosis. And this is the idea that, uh, that uh, patients don't want to know, families don't want to know, and people don't want to know this diagnosis. This is not true. Uh, uh, there is extensive evidence that people want to know this diagnosis. And again, in this late report about uh, living well with dementia and the late or the most up-to-date national dementia strategy, uh, research shows that early intervention in case of dementia is cost-effective. It can improve quality of life uh, for both the patient and their families. I like this um, uh, quote from Kitty Collins saying that aging seems to be the only available way of living a long life, but that aging and Alzheimer's disease and dementia are not the same thing. And I'll try and show you some of that today. 
So how about performing a brain scan? Where do we start with a quality service? We should restrict the referrers to dementia specialists. We don't want to be imaging all the confused patients. The patient needs to fast for six hours prior to the scan. And you can image patients with uh, diabetes, um, but their control needs to be excellent and truly excellent. Otherwise, you end up with a very low quality study. One of the things we want when performing a scan is what I describe as a stable level of neuroactivation. So we want the patient to go through the same procedures as everyone else, as much as possible. So when the patient arrives and we explain what's going to happen to them, we place a cannula. We then allow them to rest for 20 to 30 minutes to give us this stable level of neuroactivation. We want low noise, but not silent. We want low lighting, but not dark. And one of the things I do is I get the service to put a cross on the ceiling and ask the patient to just look at that. It's a bland, simple thing to do. And we want the ears unplugged. We then want the technician to return to the patient and give the injection without talking to the patient. And then we continue with the zero, with the same level of neuroactivation for 20 minutes, and then we scan the patient. So when we perform the scan, immobilization is important. So it's, uh, we'll talk about the position of uh, the head, um, but we want um, really a still comfortable patient. So it's immobility, which is top priority. We want a, uh, a reconstruction. I use a 3D brain body reconstruction and that's the best on my system. But essentially we want iterative reconstruction, but we do not want uh, point spread function. Uh, this can give a what's called a gib artifact, which is a little rind of activity that will go all the way around the brain. And this can be confusing when interpreting the scan. And we give about 200 megabecquerels. The CT, I would encourage you to deliver a isovolumetric uh, voxel with a high MAS to allow really high quality uh, coronal reconstructions. And I'll show you those. So we use a headrest. Uh, we take any random handsome young man who doesn't have uh, grey hair and you want to place them in the uh, head holder. You want to try and get a formal uh, positioning where the external meatus and the outer canthus of the eye are in the vertical plane. And you can use lasers to help you with that. And then we want some kind of simple restraint. So this is not a clamp. This is not, these are simple to remove. These are just Velcro straps, but it gives people something to feel so that they can keep their head still for the 10 or 15 minutes of acquisition that we're interested in. I want to talk about standards that we can then use or radiographers can then use to uh, develop or to, to assess the scan once it's been performed. And these are on the BNMS YouTube site. So we want to uh, align the patient as I described. And um, this position is the most likely to give us the brain in a formal position. People's faces are not symmetrical with their brain, so changes are inevitable and not a concern. 
The four things that we're going to assess are the superior parietal gyral structure. So what we want to do is make sure that when we look at a, CT, a gyral pattern on the CT component, that this gyral pattern is seen with uh, the sulcus, the white matter, the gray matter, sorry, the white matter, the gray matter, the sulcus, that we can see these details and that we're not getting unusual cross lines, ring formations. These can all suggest that the patient has moved. The other thing that we want to assess is the uh, anterior limb of the internal capsule. So there should be clear separation here between the head of the chordate nucleus and the putamen. And again, this can be lost when there's movement and rotation of the brain. The third component that we want the radiographer to check is to identify both the right and the left posterior uh, cingulate gyrus. And they should be seen in their parallel components as two separate structures. And again, where there is movement, both rotation and your movement, and this can be lost. And the fourth component is here, right down at the base of the brain, in what's called the quadrigeminal plate system, where we see both the right and the left callicula. There are superior and inferior, but they're much more difficult to see. So we want to be able to see both the right and the left callicula. And we'll see when we talk about standard reporting that will mention all of these quality indicators. But these can be things that radiographers themselves can check. So we'll ask the radiographer to check these four regions. So the superior parietal gyral structure, the anterior limb of the internal capsule, the right and left posterior cingulate gyrus and the right and left colliculi. And if these are not apparent or severely affected, then there's been significant movement. And we're going to ask the radiographer maybe to repeat the scan, so to perform this check before the patient leaves the scan. So when the scan is acquired, and the patient is ready, oh, the scans are ready, a vital step is to get consistent display of the FDG brain for dementia assessment. And I want to go through this in detail with you. We're going to select an axial slice, this axial slice, which is just at the level of the body of the chordate nucleus, which I'll show you. What this will do is give us an axial slice of the brain with the maximum amount of gray matter, but with none of the intensity of the basal ganglia. So here we can see, just see this subtle stripe of activity in the right and the left um, body of the chordate and we're going to then adjust the display at this level, and I'm going to give you three different methods. The first is the experiential method. So this is the one that I'm going to suggest that eventually you get consistent at, and that you probably will get there once you've done 100, 200 scans, and you're getting much more comfortable. Really what we want here is the uh, a, a gray scale, the widest gray scale within the gray matter that we're going to be interested in. So you can see here we've got some intense regions of gray matter and we've got some less intense regions of gray matter and this is going to give us this wide display and this is going to help us report. So you can see here this is the appropriate level and the intensity level here has an SUV of 0 to 8. And here's the total. This is the maximum SUV in the whole of the brain. But So we're here, we're going to choose 
an intensity display of 0 to 8. If we go too high, we start to see that there's far less of the uh, normal intensity, the normal brain activity, and far more of the uh, less intense regions. And we may then start to overinterpret this as pathological. So this is too this is too wide a range. This one, where the SUV, the range is now zero to seven, hopefully you can see this is too short a range, where everything is now intense, and we're going to call, we're going to say that this is all normal. So here we would overinterpret pathology, here we would underinterpret pathology, and we're going to say that this is correct. So this is the experiential display, and eventually you get used to it and you but again the key is that we're going to choose this slice, get it correct, and then not change it again. The Second method I'm going to suggest to you, an entirely practical method, is that we choose the same slice. We take a region of interest of that single slice, not a volume of interest, just a region of interest of the single slice. And that we set the upper limit at 90% for that slice alone. So this is the slice at the level of the body of the caudate nucleus. So we're going to, so at this here, we've got a range of 0.6 to 9.7. So 9.7 minus 0.6, that's the total SUV. We're going to choose 90% as the upper level of that SUV, of that range. Therefore, we're going to go from 0 to 8.2. So you can see this has turned out to be similar to the experiential assessment. So there's uh, the second method. The third method we're going to, I'm going to call the five region saturation method. And this is where we're going to use a rainbow scale. So we're going to use a graded rainbow display at the same level that we've already seen. And we're going to wait till we can see five one centimeter regions of uh, gray matter, of saturation of the lateral gray matter. So on this display, we've chosen, so this is zero to eight. You can see one, two, three, four, about five, there was nothing posterior. So about five regions, all greater than or at least one centimeter. So here's zero to eight. If we go from zero to nine, which we decided on the experiential level was too wide a range, then hopefully you can see that these regions of saturation have disappeared. And in fact, there are no regions of saturation on zero to nine. And if we go from zero to seven display, we can see now that there's extensive multiple regions of this saturated color, far greater than five regions at one centimeter. So again, that's the, uh, another method of display that we can choose. The important thing, whether we choose the experiential, the calculation method or the five levels of saturation is that we, before we do any assess, clinical assessment of the brain, we choose this slice, we set the intensity, and then we do not change it again. No matter how tempted you may be to have a little fiddle, you don't do it again. What this will give you is a reliable, display uh, that is reliable between patients, depending on variations in dose, like variations in timing, variations in age, 
variations in uh, blood sugar levels. So lots and lots of variations can affect the FDG uptake in the brain. And this will allow you to get consistent display to look for the pathology. I want to talk about structured reporting. Um, we are going to mention in our reports the five regions and the quality indicators that we've asked the radiographer. And we are going to report those and say whether they are there or whether they're present. The reason to do this is to encourage you to look at the scan. Now, this is not a criticism of the radiographer because they may have had a very agitated patient, very difficult patients, but it will give you a objective measurement of how you may have to compensate for reduced quality of scan. Uh, we are also going to comment on age-related changes. What I mean by that is that as patients get older, so especially into their 70s and 80s and 90s, the amount of FDG uptake that we see globally reduces. This is a not related to any cognitive decline, uh, but it is uh, it clearly happens and can make the interpretation of the scan more difficult. The prior techniques that we showed you for adjusting the intensity display will help you. But it does mean that in the more elderly population, the changes that we see can be more subtle. We are then going to give a regional report that I'll give you some indication of that. Uh, whether there are positive and negative changes, and then we're going to grade it mild, moderate, and severe changes within the um, within these loba regions. Mild is where we see reduced activity, but we see still see continuous activity in the grey matter. Moderate is where we see reduced activity, but we see discontinuous activity. So we see holes in the sulcal pattern. So we can still see the sulcal pattern. And severe changes are where we see it's very difficult to see any grey white matter differentiation. We're going to report the parietal, and we're going to talk about both anterior and posterior parietal regions. We're going to look at the temporal, and we're going to concentrate on the lateral and the polar regions of the temporal. In Alzheimer's disease, we know that medial temporal lobe pathology is very early, but the qualitative assessment of medial temporal lobe reduced activity is fraught with problems. We know that you can see early FDG reduction in medial temporal lobe in early Alzheimer's disease, but this is requires complex or volumetric uh, quantification. We are going to look at and mention whether you can see activity in the sensory motor cortex and maintenance of that activity. We're going to talk about the lateral and the medial occipital lobe activity. You're going to look at and assess both the right and the left posterior cingulate gyrus, the right and the left precuneus, and the anterior cingulate gyri on each side. The only one here in which SPM analysis can be useful is the anterior cingulate gyrus. But again, you can get some assessment of that qualitatively. When we look at the CT, uh, I'm going to encourage you to acquire this kind of quality of CT. So a high MAS, isovolumetric CT as a CT component of your PET CT. And we're going to look at specific things. The neuroradiological view of 
atrophy and sulcal widening as a normal finding, I think is terrible. And I have said this in front of the British Society of Neuroradiology, so I can certainly say it to you. Um, what I look at is sulcal widening. So I do not look at retraction of the brain from the cranial vault. I look at the level of sulcal widening which is there. And in a rather haphazard way, I characterize it as mild, moderate, and severe. And I say whether it's global or focal and where it's most severe. For example, in this one, it would be, uh, I would say this is moderate to severe uh, sulcal widening in the right frontal lobe. I'm then going to assess the degree of ventricular megaly. And again, I'm going to say whether that's mild, moderate or severe. I'm going to look at whether there is low attenuation, deep white matter changes and discuss its distribution and make some assessment of its severity. I'm going to talk about any mass lesions which are there, which are very rare. I've only ever diagnosed one incidental mass lesion in doing many tens of thousands of brains because most people have uh, brain imaging already. And then we're going to talk about medial uh, temporal lobe atrophy, which I will show you today. So the first part of my standard text report will actively comment on the five quality indicators and say whether I think this is good, reasonable, or reduced quality scan, depending on these four indicators. In a normal report, I would say there is no pattern of loss of regional comparative gray white matter differentiation in either cerebral hemisphere. And I want to try and unpack that a little for you. So this is a regional comparative loss of gray white matter differentiation. So remember when we talked about mild, moderate and severe um, reduced activity, this was where we either saw a global reduction but maintenance of gray matter activity, or we saw discontinuous or severe complete loss of this gray white matter differentiation. It's important here to appreciate that the white matter activity is not zero, but it is reduced in comparison with the gray matter. So this is the pattern that we're looking for. So this is the pattern that I look for. So this is what goes into my report. When I say regional comparative, it's very important that we are comparing within a cerebral hemisphere and not from side to side. Uh, I'll show you later on as we go through some of the cases that asymmetry is normal. Sometimes it is severe, and uh, this can have important indications in the clinical context of a patient. But it's very important that we don't compare one side with the other. It's very important that we don't look for symmetry. And uh, really, we are comparing uh, different lobar regions with regions that we think are normal. And in severe dementia, this can be very small regions. Generally, in the intrinsic neurodegenerative dementias, the sensory motor cortex activity is relatively well maintained. I've then put in here, I then generally put in a line that says there's relative maintenance of activity seen in the posterior cingulate gyrus, precuneus and medial occipital lobes on both sides. And again, you'll see why that is common. So we're going to, in an abnormal study, we're going to describe the lobar changes. We're going to describe the, whether there's maintenance of sensory motor cortex activity or not. Generally, if there is, it suggests that there's both parietal and frontal lobe changes. We're going to talk specifically about whether there's maintenance of medial occipital lobe, which can be important in dementia with Lewy body. Here, I'm going to encourage you to describe common but clinically unimportant changes. For example, medial frontal lobe changes are very common 
anterior parietal lobe changes on their own are very common, even in very young patients. And then I'll describe the severity of these changes, each one. So we'll describe our mild, moderate, or severe, and we'll describe the asymmetry. The third component of the report will be an assessment of the CT scan. We're going to look for the sulcal widening, whether it's mild, moderate, or severe, and if there are any a variation in the lobar distribution. We're going to look for ventricular megaly, and we're going to look at medial temporal lobe atrophy, the Shelton's grading that I will show you. When it comes to the conclusion, I say there is no evidence for an intrinsic neurodegenerative dementia. An intrinsic neurodegenerative dementia, I mean Alzheimer's disease, Lewy body dementia, or frontotemporal lobe dementia, even though they're often a mixture of pathologies. I also put in a line about amyloid imaging, uh, which we'll briefly mention today, and uh, but we, uh, uh, um, which I sometimes encourage. If it's a positive scan, I say, there is evidence for an early or established intrinsic neurodegenerative dementia, depending on the global assessment of the severity of the changes seen. I suggest whether the overall pattern seen is most suggestive of Alzheimer's disease, dementia with Lewy body, frontotemporal lobar dementia, or vascular dementia. I then say whether there's evidence of one of the other types of dementia. And then I say this would suggest a, underneath me it says, true mixed dementia. If we look at my practice from Belfast, this gives you some breakdown of the kinds of diagnoses that we made. And a significant proportion of these would be mixed dementias. What I want you to notice is the nearly 20% of equivocal results. So no matter how experienced you are, no matter how much you see, about 20% of patients will have a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and be very difficult to assess. And um, you just must be comfortable uh, with this and uh, be happy with this finding. It can be important to integrate this into a dementia MDT. Um, and I think this is an important step. Probably 10 years ago, I would have said it was vital, but uh, I think you can provide a good service without there being a functioning MDT, but it is a, a good quality indicator. And again, I'll discuss about both the advantages and disadvantages of that as we talk about other things. So FDG uh, is imaging a fundamental process in the pathology of clinical dementias and we'll discuss that. Uh, and we're going to discuss uh, later on how this correlates with neuropsychopathology. We think we can, we'll show you that FDG is uh, imaging a clinical pathological process within all the dementias, that's very important. And um, that identification of early disease allows current interventional te techniques to change patients' outcome. So thank you for listening for this first part and we'll go on to the following talks. Thank you.